Hi, I'm Juliet Wolf Robin, National Executive Director of American Photographic Artists. APA is a not for profit trade association of professional photographers run by photographers for photographers. APA's mission is to advance its members' professional well being in the photo community at large. APA connects photographers with other industry professionals, keeps them informed about industry opportunity and challenges, and provides tools to navigate an ever changing landscape. At APA, we have a very active diversity committee that you can find out more about on, at apanational.org. The committee chair is Martine Severin, and this series of SCOPE was created in order to provide an open conversation about diversity, equality, and inclusion. Nader Khoury from our diversity committee helps to produce this series, and today he is on assignment, so Jill Broussard is helping behind the scenes. They are all professional photographers volunteering their time, and we thank them. Today's conversation is moderated by APA member Josue Rivas. Jose, Josue Rivas is an indigenous futurist, creative director, visual storyteller, and educator working at the intersection of art, technology, journalism, and decolonization. His work aims to challenge the mainstream narrative about indigenous peoples, co-create with the community, and serve as a vehicle for collective healing. He is a 2020 Catchlight Leadership Fellow, Magnum Foundation Photography and Social Justice Fellow, founder of Standing Strong Project, and co-founder of the site Indigenous Photograph. In a moment, he will introduce you to the panelists. After the presentation, we will invite everyone who is here to join in on the Q&A. If you happen to be watching this recording later, you won't be able to access that part of the conversation, but we invite, and we invite you to join live in the future and be part of the community. So sign up for the emails at apanational.org. And please, if you are not an APA member, consider joining. And we thank those of you who are here today who are members. I'm going to pass it over to Josue and spotlight our speakers. Thank you, Juliet. Um, Piali, everybody. Uh, my name is Josue Rivas. And Really grateful to be here today. Really grateful to be able to gather with all of you um, in, in this way. So um, first before anything, I would like to acknowledge that I am uh, currently in the traditional uh, territory of the Multoma, the Wasco, the Cowlitz, the Clackamas, the mm -hmm. the Clackamas, Banuk Chinook, Tulatin, Kalapuya, Molaya, and many other tribes that made their home along the Columbia River. I want to acknowledge the people that were here first and the people that are still here. Um, and then at the same time, uh, this, this conversation, this circle, it's, it's, really, it's really special for me because we have some people that I admire a lot, some people that, um, that I see as thinkers and, and really you know, visionaries in, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways for me. Um, so we have uh, Cynthia, who is an amazing storyteller, visual storyteller um, from Mexico. And we have uh, Kara Romero and we have Obed Valadez, who is uh, one of my mentors and, and founder um, of industry. Um, and with that being said, I wanna pass it on to you, Cynthia, if you'd like to introduce yourself and, uh, and show us some work. Thank you so much, Josue and Juliet. Um, I want to start also with the acknowledgement and recognizing that we are in Lenape territory in New York. And I want to recognize the indigenous people of this territory. And these Lenape people now share uh, a space with Mesoamerican and Andean uh, indigenous people, such as Mixtecos, Tlapanecos, Otomis, Nahuas, Tepeguas, Quichos, and, and Aymaras. And um, as these indigenous people of Las Americas are, have been uh, categorizing when they cross borders and territories by a government that has existed for less than 250 years uh, as illegal and documented immigrants or aliens, I honor the ancestors of these lands, the original people of Las Americas. I am going to share my screen. Give me access to share sorry, my screen. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Cynthia Santos. As Josue was saying, I am from Mexico and I work in the intersection in photography, uh, ethnography, archives, and writing and visual narratives. I study anthropology and ethnohistory back in Mexico and for 10 years I worked as a researcher. Uh, and since 2016, I have been working as a photographer, but also I have been working also as a community organizing uh, with a pro-immigrant organization across New York and beyond. And the work that I am going to present right now is my first photo project that is called Abuelas. Uh, this is Gisela Bravo and is a member of the community that I am part in Sonsen Park. I start this project uh, question me uh, about the, the new ways to document uh, migration and new ways to show how uh, can I portray uh, women, uh, immigrant women, women of color, working class women. And for me, in the moment that I start this project, I was trying to to understand how the media is portraying working class women, migrant, women who don't have papers to live in the United States. So uh, I, I knew all of these women through my community work. So I just started experimenting with Gisela and she asked me one day to take a photo of her because she wanted to send this photo to her grandchildren that are in Mexico and she don't know because she has been for three decades in this country and still she doesn't have um, papers. So when I saw the agency that she has, when I took the photograph, I start to create an, a statement and proposal of this project and, and, and to collaborate with these uh, women. I asked them, how do you like to be represented in this portrait? Imagine that this uh, pro, uh, portrait is going to be shown in an in a exhibition or a newspaper, who you are, who is your identity, but also the, the project speak about the territory, the belonging, how we recreate in a small space, sometimes it's only the, the, the bedroom, because you know, living in, in, New, in, in New York is so expensive. So what does it mean, uh, the territory for this woman, all the memory that they find in their works? So um, with this project, I start, you know, to, to work more uh, with the idea of collaboration. So I am going to pass to the second project that I did that is about um, people who took refugee, migrants who took refugee in churches uh, to avoid deportation. And I start with the idea to do more for a photojournalist style in this project, but at the end, I I came into the same idea of collaboration, but I add to this project drawings, writing. I asked the people to draw about their experience. For me also was the question about how can I photograph people when they are in this process of trauma? You know, how can my photographs can be uh, restaurative, can get a restaurative message and no and um, speak the, uh, at the same time about the painful uh, or, or, or the difficulties that they are, they are passing through. So through this project that I was saying, I asked the children who live or used to live in these churches with their parents to cry about their experience. I use also archives to also uh, try to understand and contextualize the the, the historical crisis, the political crisis that we are facing right now, but that we did before. So I use archive materials and the project is about the intersection between religious solidarity and the migration crisis, how uh, churches or, or worship places are redefined concepts such as sanctuary, uh, misericordy and all of these words. Um, and as I was saying, I, I think that for me, when I ask the people to write or draw instead to interview them, I feel that I am trying to create uh, mutual uh, relations, less hierarchy relationship in, in, the, in, the, in the process of documenting. So um, this is part of the result. Uh, 
So right now I am working in two projects at the same time. One is Spaces of Detention that is also a collaborative project that uh, investigate how the, the, the incarceration, the detention, I think detention is an euphemism, uh, the incarceration shape the social interaction and the well-being uh, of human beings, uh, uh, of their families and communities. I am working for this project in the in four jails in the north of New Jersey. Uh, you know, like uh, the media speaks a lot about the detention center in the border, and New Jersey has the highest rates of incarceration. And and the idea to create also collage in these projects and drawings with the people who have been in these places. Uh, response um, a political and ethical way to see this uh, social problem. Uh, don't you know? Like I, I see the that the media is over and over taking photos of migrants and, and violated violated at some point the bodies of these people. And I don't want to repeat again. You know, to take photos of these people again and again because I have seen that all of these horrible photos that the media is showing about detention that for one hand, we need to know what is happening inside of the detention or outside, but for the other hand, we don't see any changes in, in the legislative uh, way. So the idea in creating like collages together and drawings and, and, and narratives uh, written by the, the, the people who have experienced this um, this process uh, for me was more important. How in community, in collectively, can we speak about this problem that is affecting a lot of, not just migrants, a lot of human beings in this country that is the, the country who has more incarcerated people in the world. So for example, in this, uh, in this photo, we see a, a writing in, in Quiche and, and in Spanish. It's also for me, this project took me to another that is to speak about the indigenous people incarcerated in the United States that don't speak either Spanish and English. And they are deported more easily because they don't understand the language. Uh, it's a lot of moms, Utujiles, a lot of Mayans uh, communities that are now facing this. So the other project that I'm going to show uh, is about indigenous communities in New York City. And, and I, uh, the idea was to speak and, and be more clear that because the media uh, put us in the category of Latinos. And, and for example, I don't identify myself as a Latina. I, I as a mestiza with indigenous root, with Nahuas root, but also mestizo. So, all of these people speak a language. Uh, she speaks Quiche, but we, we have people that I have been photographing in a participatory way also that I speak Ma, Mixteco, Mepa, Otomi, Nahua, uh, mostly uh, now in, in the cities, but also in the fields of the United States, a lot of the migrants speak a language, came from the rural uh, places of Mexico, Guatemala, or Central America sometimes. So I wanted to speak also together with them about what are the experience of indigenous people when they cross in the border. For example, this is a collage that was made in collaboration with a, a girl, a no company girl who was uh, in detention in Texas. So she wrote her experience in her own language, Quiche, and we made together this collage. Um, this is a, a photo collage made uh, with a friend who speak Mije, that is from Oaxaca. And is this, this text is kind of a poet and sometimes it's a little bit difficult to translate it into English or, or Spanish because it's, uh, sometimes they don't have the words to explain it in another language, but it's, it's about what does it mean to be an indigenous in this city? And um, I am also documenting the, the da different kind of dance of traditions. Uh, for example, these ones, some of them are, you know, pre-Hispanic, some of they are kind of a mix, colonial, uh, with some roots of the pre-Hispanic epoch. Uh, this is also the, the in, this, in this project, the component of, of language is really important for me because at some points, I want to push this project to speak about the linguistic justice and, and how we need to be aware about the, 
de, 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 de that these immigrants are no Latinos. They speak their own language. And you know, a language is a cosmovision, a way to think, an ideology, a way to live. So uh, the differences between indigenous migration and Latino migration. This is Don Jose, that is a close friend of mine. He's a healer, he speaks Totonaca from the north of Puebla. And he has been living in New Jersey for many years and working as a healer. Uh, he's the, the only thing that he know, ha, knows. Uh, and also trying to collect archives of these uh, people uh, about their heritage, who they are, uh, how are they, their, their, their communities, their places, their territories, and try to understand in better ways uh, this uh, immigration that as I say at the beginning, when I did the acknowledgement, these people has been in Las Americas for for a long time ago, so they belong here. They 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 are part of this continent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia. Appreciate that so much. Such a beautiful body of work. Um, Kara Romero, yeah. Would you like to share maybe some some of your work? Thank you, Josue, for inviting me. Cynthia, your body of work is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. My name is Kara Romero, and today I am logging in from the land of the Tongva and Gabrielino peoples in the Los Angeles area, sharing ancestral territory with their sister tribes, the Chumash, Ahashman, Serrano, Kumie, Kawia, Mojaves, all the people of Southern California um, consider Los Angeles actually the, the center of creation, right? The ocean, this particular area holds a lot of spirit and uh, no doubt uh, still carries that energy um, throughout time. Uh, I'm um, born to mixed race parents. I was born in Inglewood in Los Angeles to a Native American father. I'm an enrolled member of the Chimwebe Indian tribe. Um, our tribe is located in the Mojave Desert of California. And um, my mom is Anglo, they were high school sweethearts. And then in 1979, um, my whole family, um, grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, um, mom and dad, brother and sister moved to the Chimwevi Valley Indian Reservation in um, the Mojave Desert of California. My parents split pretty early and I went back and forth between Houston, Texas and the Chimwebe Valley Indian Reservation giving me um, a very um, two world cultural experience, um, both white and native, urban and rural. And I really feel like that kind of just formed my identity and then my art later on. I work um, as a contemporary fine art photographer um, as well as doing a lot of activism work um, for environmental and social justice for Native peoples through the Bioneers nonprofit organization. I'm so honored to be here to share my work, which I kind of consider um, work that is at the intersection of both contemporary Native identity as well as um, pop culture. Um, this is the landscape that I am from, so the Great Basin, um, the Mojave Desert, and I was raised by these wonderful women um, that were in the Los Angeles area through uh, an era of Native American history called relocation and termination, when a lot of people left their reservations and came to big urban um, cities. There were seven major cities that a lot of Native Americans were relocated to um, before we moved back to our reservation. Um, one of the things that I realized going back and forth between um, the rural Native American reservation and then the urban sprawl of Houston, Texas, was that um, for the large part, most um, Americans in the cities really had no um, accurate concept of the modern Native American. Everything was, tight, was taught as bygone um, and in historical context. And there was a great amount of erasure, um, not only in the media, but also in textbooks. Um, and so I, I knew from a very early age um, that there was not a lot of content or access um, to the world that we live in in modern times. 
Um, so you'll see a lot of my work at the intersection of um, these ideas of pop culture and indigeneity. Uh, this one is called Coyote Tales. Um, and I made this one in 2017. It's made in um, Northern New Mexico and um, really is about placing, um, you know, Native American friends um, within this context of American um, sub pop culture. So you see the low rider, um, you see uh, the nightlife, but it's combined with the mythos of Coyote, our fabled trickster, who often shows up when um, poor decisions are about to be made, but we love him nonetheless. So really um, a celebration of our humanity, uh, which is one of the things that recurs, um, I think in a lot of work from um, people that are from communities of color, this real emphasis like Cynthia was talking about on our humanity um, and um, a more celebration of beauty and resilience and um, the wonderful things about our culture. This one um, is called The Last Indian Market and um, is a direct reference to Da Vinci's Last Supper. And really the idea behind this was, um, you know, photography from outside of the culture is often about um, desiring a glimpse into our culture, into our cultural privacy. Um, but for me, it's often um, uh, an emphasis of mine to place people, to place um, friends and family in contemporary context, asserting that we understand outside cultures and are fluent in pop culture and um, modernity, I think is what psychologically happens. This one is called TV Indians. So my pieces are very staged and um, theatrical and from the imagination, often dreamscapes is how I'm coming up with them. Um, most everything is done in camera, but I do utilize photo illustration um, as well. So for example, this one, everything is done in camera, but the images are placed onto the televisions. So they're both turned on with a generator out there in the landscape. And then images of how we are portrayed as Native Americans are placed onto the television set. So the viewer can see the stark contrast between how we're portrayed in the media and then how we look in real life. I often say this one is like a postmodern Edward Curtis. So it does, I did take it to the, I usually work in color um, for the psychological effects of um, the contemporary feeling. Um, and emphasizing that we're not always um, in historic context, uh, but this one was purposefully a reference to Curtis and the figurative landscape. This next body of work, um, I often try to work in a, a theme of uh, environmental justice, speaking to um, themes of environmental racism, um, of eco-apartheid that communities of color um, and Native Americans face. So this was um, a series of underwater images that I did in 2015 um, that are a reference both to climate change and um, the future, um, the flooding, the impending flooding that is coming, as well as the flooding that is here um, already and how indigenous communities are impacted um, in disproportionate um, ways through climate change. Um, and then also this piece speaks to how um, the US government has often um, taken the lands of uh, indigenous communities um, for the exploration of energy um, and resource extraction. So our tribe, along with many other tribes, were forced out of our ancestral valleys um, in the name of hydroelectric energy. And our country has a long history of that from um, gold in the Black Hills to um, hydroelectric energy, to oil, um, and um, also to um, solar and wind energy. So in Southern California, we're seeing the largest land grab um, of indigenous lands across the desert that we've ever experienced, um, impacting not only 
um, indigenous peoples, but also resident animals, um, endangered species. A lot of people see the desert as this big open empty space, but it is in fact um, the second most biodiverse um, ecosystem in the world behind the rainforests. This piece is called Evolvers. So a lot of um, pointed commentary evolvers um, in the sense that we are embracing renewable energies, but um, hoping that the view viewer pauses to think about the impacts of um, infrastructure on race and class um, and the washes that these wind turbines are placed in are actually tide pools of the desert. A lot of times my work is um, um, meant to bring visibility to living cultures within the United States, um, brilliant indigenous cultures that thrive and exist. These um, young boys I work with often, they're um, two sets of brothers from my reservation. Um, I babysat their parents, so I'm uh, affectionately uh, auntie status, <laughs> which is a high honor. Um, and uh, they create this repeated pattern that is um, um, arresting and beautiful. This is taken at sunset on a hilltop and they are um, practicing their bird singing. I'm also um, from a tribe that uh, has um, great gender equity. So um, our women hold um, power in governance and in place. And we're taught from a very young age um, that we have innate strength as life givers. And we um, were never taught that we're not to speak or take up space, how's that? And um, so a lot of times women take a strong um, center role in my portraits. And a lot of these portraits are about um, not only giving um, the woman agency, this one is called Naomi. So they're very editorial. They're very much about their um, very unique individual identity, as well as the diversity of the tribes that they're from, um, but also about self-image um, and taking back um, our bodies as women of color um, and rejecting um, Eurocentric views on our body and control of our body and othering of our bodies. This one is called Ka and um, has uh, this idea of the mythos of clay woman um, passed down to Ka Fawel, who is a contemporary ceramic artist. Um, she has a second image of a Mesa Verde vessel overlaid um, onto her skin. And uh, the whole story behind this piece is how um, the spirit of clay woman has been passed down to her through thousands of years. Her hair was captured at one eight thousandth of a second. So every light in the studio um, to kind of capture that energy of firing the clay. Oh, sorry, it's doing something. This one is Thai, um, much more simple, a portrait um, in front of an antique um, Navajo or Diné blanket from the 1920s. And the shells from here along the central coast of California, um, connecting the women that made the photograph um, that were both from California and the Southwest. So reinvoking, reinvigorating trade routes to put the white shells um, around her neck, white shell woman being incredibly important to um, Diné uh, nation. This is some newer work um, that I've been working on a series of um, representation in the genre of film noir. Um, so this idea of um, suspense and psychological, um, uh, psychological suspense with native narratives. Um, another portrait that I did recently, and I'd like to end with a portrait of my daughter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. That that every time I see your photographs, it makes me feel something. It's, it's so beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm gonna share myself too. It's kind of hard to go after both of you because <laughs> you guys have such amazing work. Uh, but let me see. I have 
a little presentation here. Um, yeah, I think that the I think we're living in a very interesting interesting moment when it comes to the medium of photography and the really the future of storytelling in general. I think that we're in a transformative space and moment that in a few years we're gonna realize, you know, that we're in it, but we still haven't realized that we're in it. So we're kind of like going 100 miles per hour, looking at that rear view mirror in my eyes. Um, a little bit about my work. Um, I I think I was made to be a photographer, and now now that I'm a little older, I understand that this was my destiny and this was my my path. Um, but in 2016, when I was at Standing Rock, um, documenting this this very beautiful movement, um, and in my eyes what it felt like an awakening of humanity. Um, that's where I think that the seed of, of <clears throat> what the future can look like for this medium, for this, not even just photography as, as a whole, but like I said, for the, the whole place of storytelling in our, in our society. I think that's where it began, where I realized that images don't only have to be made for the reactionary moment, and for you know the new cycle but the images and and stories can be also preserved and sent for future generations that that in fact we can communicate with those future uh, descendants of us that we'll never get to meet and also reconnect with our ancestors and and put all that into a story put all that into a photograph and i think that after sending rock and after being able to document something that was much bigger than ourselves. Um, sorry, that's when I realized that, that there was so much that we could do because indigenous peoples are naturally storytellers, but also we are visionaries. And, and I think that standing rock taught me that, that there was a moment that we were all sitting on and that was much bigger than just a protest or an opposition to a pipeline. And I think that through that process, I started realizing that, that if, if other people that I keep going to in the industry and say, hey, you know, this could be like this, what do you think? And they'll be like, no, that's a little too out there, that I was not gonna be able to do it if I went and knock on those doors over and over and get rejected. So I realized that we had to create our own ways and, and really explore what it could look like if we made things instead of shoot them, or if we made things instead of taking them from people. That, that in fact, the language, and, and I use this word because it's a word that is, is, very, um, is very relevant, is this colonial settler way of making images was no longer fitting for where we were going. That if we were going to, to do something that truly resonated with future generations, that we had to change the process from the beginning to end. So in this, in this way, I, I realized that I had to remove myself as a photographer, right? That I had to create a system that gave the shutter to the person and it was a space for them to, to give us their story and to envision to the future. So that's how this project was born, the Sending Strong Project. These images not only are collaborations, but I think that they're also, there is an element of intention of healing. And by that, I mean that, that, that the sole purpose of the whole session, you know, we don't do photo shoot, we do sessions. And the collaborator, not the subject, that they, they're gonna give us something that they don't even know they might be giving us at the moment, whether it's, you know, a little story of their childhood or whether it is a beautiful portrait or a beautiful message that there's something, there's an exchange happening. And that through that exchange, there is so much beauty and, and almost like reconnection to almost like, almost like healing our relationship with photography as indigenous peoples. That, that these tools don't have to, you know, preserve us because we're gonna all die away or, or to marginalize our experiences in our own continent, <laughs> I'll say it like that, because we don't need that anymore. And, and that these images could be something 
that was preserved for those future peoples. So through that process, I think that I learned that we're in a, in a very, in a very important moment for humanity, not just for photography. I'm not truly concerned with photography, to be completely honest. I'm true. I'm concerned with humanity and with humans. So I think that if we take on what, what's about to come next, which is this space of reckoning with a lot of, a lot of stuff that might have been normal for us for a long time, and maybe we were born into it. And the industry as a whole is going to have to go through the process, whether they like it or not. And I think that in that process, we're going to see that intention and compassion and even changing our language a little bit is going to be the key for the future of humanity. And as storytellers, as people that do creative work, I think we have a, a responsibility, not only for ourselves, but I think for the future of humanity. That, you know, in 15, 20 years, when we look back, we can say, well, what, what were the images that I was making? How was I making those images and who I was making them for? As I, was I making them for us to sell something? Or was I making them because the community and the people that were all involved in it all saw this bigger message, this bigger purpose? This is an image actually that it's up in in Portland, Oregon, at Industry um, PDX, and it was a collaboration after um, yeah, after like Black Lives Matter, um, Black Lives Matter like protests and things happening here where I saw a lot of indigenous folks showing up in, in solidarity, but I met uh, Amber who is both African-American and also Muskoka Cree indigenous. So it was really beautiful just to, to, to see that, you know, that collaboration go up on, onto a whole wall to be on, yeah. And then I'll leave it, I'll leave it at this, that the future of, of photography, I think, and storytelling and humanity is an indigenous future a place where we can dismantle racist, you know, mascot names. And then we can be part of that conversation around, around technology, around, you know, like how do we preserve and, and really reimagine society through an indigenous lens. And I think the storytelling has a big part to play in that. And as we collaborate and as we make images with people, we, you know, nobody ever forgets how they make, how you make them feel. And I think that now more than ever, we're realizing that, that our feelings matter as humanity, you know, that, that we do have a, a side of us collectively that, that needs to reckon with a lot and that it might be painful to look into or to even listen to those voices that, that are telling you those things. But I think that my hope is that with this work and, and really with the work that all the beautiful um, you know, panelists put out here today, um, that, you, that you all take something where there is a future and there is a, um, here, give me one second, stop me sharing this. There is a, an opportunity for collaboration, I guess you can say. That, that's really where I wanna leave it at with this um, because we have an amazing, friend, amazing mentor, and, and creative, really. I, I really think that I see my friend Obed here as a creative, um, as a visionary. So uh, with that being said, Obed, do you want, maybe want to jump in here and introduce yourself? And then we're going to kind of go into a little panel mode. Amazing. Thank you, Josue. Thank you. What an amazing uh, set of work. And to me, what's incredible is the impact uh, that you guys are doing through the power of creativity. Um, Josue did it, uh, an acknowledgement for my region, but I'm logged in, uh, in in Portland. And I obviously acknowledge and have mad respect for uh, this land. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I was born in Mexico and I migrated here at a young age or as a lot of Americans call it, crossed the border illegally here at a young age. Um, you know, was in Chicago, uh, Milwaukee, um, where I became uh, a visual painter. Um, I went to the School of the Art Institute Chicago, um, did some incredible work there, but I was always bothered 
by the idea of a technique versus a question. And I always had this desire, and this is where Josue and I really connect, along with a lot of the work that you guys are doing, which is questioning. This question, this urge of what is this future that we're creating today? Even if I don't get to experience it, what is this future that I can create today? And how do I leverage the right platforms, the right motives to bring in this power of creativity, this gift, this third eye that we may have been born with or inherited or within our ancestors that we can actually truly drive change. So from there, I, I transformed into a product designer, an industrial designer, uh, have several patents, work for a legendary company called IDEO. And then I realized it's like, it's not about the product. It's about the context, the stories, the the power of brand, the power of ways to really manifest an idea and became a creative director. Um, so now I, I'm the founder of Industry. It's a little over 10 years. We are in Portland, Los Angeles, New York. Um, and for us, our vision is really to create next. And what do I mean by that is, as I mentioned, we create the future for brands. And what do I mean by that? is that we actually push brands forward. Most of our projects are 18 months out, 12 months out, three years, five years. And we truly, truly try to figure out ways to impact people, to shift behaviors, and really to create beautiful, beautiful outputs um, that connect humanity with a brand because brands aren't going anywhere. So, we have to leverage their platforms and then the truth of who we are as humans and bring them together to create new purpose. So some of the work that we have done is, I'll give you a couple of the first. So we work really closely with Nike. Um, you know, we did the first Spanish uh, campaign that launched in America, the first ever. We pushed them to get there. We worked in the holiday, actually, Josue worked with us really closely on this and really tried to be as authentic as possible with a project called You Can't Stop Our Voice, where we elevated true heroes, not just renowned LeBron James, Serena, and whoever, but everyday heroes in our communities, in underserved communities, Black, Indigenous, um, you know, Mexican, and really elevated these individuals to show the change that they're doing. We did it through film, through powerful photography, uh, through really getting into using different platforms to elevate them. And I continue to work with individuals and experts like Josue to really try to push brands to do the right thing. Most, more recently, I'm working really closely with Lego and figure out a true sustainable approach for a plastic brick. Like, how do you grab a DNA like that and try to figure out, one, a purposeful approach, um, a sustainable approach, and an inclusive approach? In that kickoff, it was really interesting because everyone's like, I love Lego, I love... And I was like, I grew up very poor. I didn't have Lego. So how do I really figure out the diversity or the meaning behind that? And then lastly, um, working closely with Converse, to shift the model from it being a, a brand that sells shoes, a canvas shoe, to it being a canvas for progress, a canvas for youth, a canvas for change to happen in inclusivity, diversity, sustainability, and enablement. And this is something that we worked through for the last 18 months. And as an example, and this is everything from films to really getting out there and empowering people and creating um, ex an accelerator to help fund ideas of, of true young individuals that want to create change. But in doing this, the brand actually got 15% gain in their market share and awareness that became global. So that goes to show you that the power of meaningful change of creating the future and the brand can happen. And we strive for that. That is what motivates me. Uh, and really using the power of creativity, that is photography, everyone on this call, 
I'm actually very excited and I'm excited to collaborate with new faces, new voices, and like, let's create true change um, and all the other mediums out there that we can leverage. Um, so I'm very honored for, for, for being invited by Josue, Cynthia, Caro, I love, love all the work. Um, and I'm excited to, to hear from you guys. I'll hand it off to Josue. Thank you, thank you, thank you I appreciate that. Um, I think that this is a question for, for all of you. Um, for, I think that what brings me, what I think about right away when I see the work, when I see the intention and, and you know, the, the craftsmanship in, in what like, for example, Cynthia and Kara are doing, I, I think about, well, how do we, how do we preserve something that is um, really to a lot of people very sacred, you know, like giving up their story and, and maintain it humane? How do you, how do you retain the humanity in, in the story when, for example, you know, there is a brand involved or, or things like that where, where, where everyone wants to consume these images of in, you know, my migrants or of indigenous peoples. And I think that, yeah, like well, what, what is, how do you preserve it? Because I've been, I've been trying to understand that, you know? So maybe, yeah, maybe like Kara, like how do you preserve your, your that, you know, that story? How do you make sure it stays true to what it is and not uh, get taken advantage of? That was um, truly a long journey for me as a young photographer. Um, I, I set out to be a photographer because I loved it, because I fell in love with the medium. And it was only after I fell in love that I realized it was very problematic um, in um, the relationship that it's had to native and indigenous people, the exploitive nature of photography, um, you know, how a story can be uh, changed so much through, through who's behind the camera. And um, I really had to, I, I chose to not quit, but instead um, as an artist, I'm always, that's like the number one thing that I hold in my heart as you know, I walk through this life as a photographer is how can I be of service um, to my community? I think that um, you know, when we're photographing people from communities of color, there's a lot of you know, free prior and informed consent. So a lot of like what Cynthia is talking about, a lot of collaboration, a lot of interviewing, a lot of, is this idea good? Is this appropriate to share? Do you feel good about this? And then I think it even one step further that before I ever, you know, release something that I've worked on in post, I make sure that they like it, you know? Um, do you like the way that you ended up looking, you know? Um, and, uh, I think walking through this journey, always trying to make sure that you're being of service to the community. So not taking, um, but instead giving back. And I think maybe that when, you know, we grow up within these communities and like Oved said, like we're poor, right? Like that already changes your perspective, you know, like it costs so much money to be a photographer. I'm sure there's like the number one reason why people from communities of color don't become photographers, you know, it's like, so how many times so sway where you're like, I can't afford this, like, what am I doing, you know, <laughs> but then you get there and you've honed your craft and all of a sudden you're like, the weapon is not like, the weapon becomes something like a gift, right? you like, all of a sudden you have turned this into something that can be of service to your community and you know I didn't know that the world was going to be consuming photographs you know like that's something that has definitely changed in my career like it used to be something in books and a special interest but now it's like everywhere I think we're looking at photographs more than we're reading or doing anything you know um and so I think that that's how we counter the exploitive nature of photography is walking through in service to our communities, in service for accurate representation, in service for those ideas that Cynthia was talking about and Oved of, and Josue of collaboration. Like we come from a different space um, and like definitely um, not egocentric. It's much more interdependent and community centered. Thank you, thank you, Kara. Um, what about for you, Cynthia? How do you keep that 
you know, yeah, from going into very vulnerable, you know, hard things to experience to when you put it out in a book or you put it on, you know, on a social media or in a, in a magazine? How does, how do you preserve it? Thank you so much. And I'm not apologize. I didn't notice that I was sharing my screen under the 24 cent <laughs> no full screen. Well, you know, when I do photography in collaboration, I also try to recognize that I, even though I am a woman of color and in this country, I have the category of women of color and migrant and I have residency. I know that I have more power than the people that I am photographing. So I try to nivelate this, this, this hierarchy to try to create more horizontal relationship with the people that I am working. And we were speaking the other day about colonization and how um, they colonize the photography. And for me, for example, one of the things that I am conscious more now than, than before is not just the language, it's also the, the idea that don't take uh, the authorship uh, just by myself. I try to, to, to think that the authorship needs to be um, shared. You know, I take the photo, but the people where I am collaborating are also part of this authorship. Uh, and I share the photos with them. And it, this is part of the colonial also mentality that we took photos to the people and we never see them again. And we use and mercantilize these photographs. And most of the time the people don't know where are going and they have their photos. So um, uh, it's difficult because at the end it's, it's something that I was speaking with, with a friend uh, about how, uh, you know, that for example, right now I have the power to be in this talk and speak about my work in collaboration and, and no others, other people that are in, in my photos. So for me, it's being aware of the, of the privilege that at some point we have and how can we be a path or a bridge to other people that are for our communities that don't have, as Cara was saying, the possibility to study art because in our communities it's really difficult to make it because buy a camera is difficult. For example, right now I am doing film and it's really expensive. So I am aware all the time and I don't forget where I am coming from. And, and and I, I want to also, I work a lot in the community through workshops to encourage people, uh, young people from my community that their parents most of the time are in this legal status that I don't want to say again this word like, uh, but um, to encourage them to study, to encourage them to, 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 to speak about their, their own narratives and and also uh, speak about in our communities how the people that don't belong um, or training them, maybe, I don't know, this is something that maybe in community we can discuss how the, the photographers or the journalists or anthropologists that don't belong to our communities uh, come and take and don't come back, you know? So um, for me, it's the same that Obed was saying. It's more about question, 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 and ask. And, and also ask the people all the time, are you, are you okay if I take this photo, if I publish? Also, you know, I am aware because I don't, I don't work a lot with releases. And I understand that in this country, you have to be aware of legal situations. But I feel that releases are really violent. Uh, because when you have to give all the, the power to the people that take the photo. Uh, and I am not sure that I want to use uh, the releases. I am trying to create my own releases um, to, to make uh, feel comfortable to the people where I work with. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that would be a different paradigm, you know, of like, what does what the world look like of collaboration without having to take everything, you know? Um, for you, Obed, what does that look like? I mean, I, I'm really in, interested in, in to hear how does that look like working with a brand, telling a story and keeping that foundation of, of community. How, how do you keep that going? Uh, 
I mean, I think, and you've seen me in action. It's it's a lot of courage. You got to keep fighting. It sounds weird, but it's it's true because if you're going to do something that is truthful, that has empathy, you have to have uh, humility. I always ask myself, who the hell am I? Who am I to tell the story of, you know, this black, amazing coach who has survived? Who the heck am I? Do you know what I mean? Similar, you, and you've co-created with me, uh, using that humility uh, to truly co-create. Like I don't believe, and I and you and a lot of us, a lot of us are using this word, and I and and it's true. To truly co-create is to have an intention, to have that intention with questions, to have that intention where you're actually building with them. I don't sit there and give someone a script and then go shoot them and then say, okay, say this tagline. That's not how I work with with a lot of communities. We create with them. They write the script. They see the tone they add a bit of their soul into it because then it's honest and you feel it. You can see the difference. You can see the, the difference. Um, and ultimately, I think it comes down to trust. Um, I am very lucky because through all my fighting, I have the trust of CMOs. I have the trust of leadership, but it, I want the trust of the stories that I'm telling. And that's more important to me than a trust that I already have uh, as a as a storyteller, right? So that trust, to me, it's you have to work and you have to honor it as much as possible. And that's the way that we approach stuff. And it's a it's very iterative. Also, I was like, oh, we're doing another. I was like, yes, we're gonna do it together. We're gonna write it, and then we're gonna do the story arc together, and then we're gonna look at it and look at these locations that we're shooting, what they're wearing. Every little detail, we're constantly, truly, truly co-creating, but building trust so that you can do it again. And I mean, I hope that answers it. Mm. No, yeah, thank you. That, that, was, that was really, really good because I've seen you do that and I've seen the process of how you have to take like five different steps when most people take one step, mm. um, which is really, really interesting. Um, what do you all think is the future of, of not even photography and, and or storytelling, but what do you think is, how can we relate the future of humanity with the, with what we're doing creatively? You know, I feel like there's a big gap when people think, talk about this stuff. It's like well, only in the photography world or the film world or this nature, this, or that niche. And I'm, I'm really curious, like, well, how can we connect that to, to the future of all of us too? Because I feel like it, it is an indigenous based future um and yeah how do you keep that going Kara? like when you think about like your future of your work like how are you connecting that and how do you see it um i think that's such a big question but for me i think with um a mixed cultural audience that i think it's important to identify that um a an equitable future really starts in the present for me. And so like we did this exercise and I was, you know, it was actually with pioneers and sorry to digress a little bit, but it was like the future that we want, you know, and it was predominantly Anglo. And it was really like, um, I found myself like really hurt. Like, do you know what our present looks like? Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm much more concerned with like, an equitable now then uh, and so I guess that that's what the future is that I want is you know like um to bring our communities up and and um I I your work is so powerful Cynthia but it's really like it's got a lot of that heart about um how do we bring um everybody to the same place that are living under you know marginalization and oppression and you know poverty, but so rich with other things, a culture and vibrancy and interdependence of family and community. Um, I love that um, people are crossing the digital divide and picking up cameras. And um, I like to work with the Las Fotos project here in LA. I think that that's so powerful enabling um, people 
from their own communities to be able to tell their own stories because there's so such a wealth of content there, right? Like we are at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to um, communities telling their own stories. And so I look forward to, you know, all of the phone photos and all of the Instagram reels and social media, you know, taking over and moving film. Um, I think we're just gonna continue to see it. And for me, the internet was really the first time that I was able to see, you know, these portrayals reflected, you know, especially like when we're isolated in these really small rural communities, you know, the internet and the web was like, and social media has been like this revolution of connection, you know? Um, and I think we're seeing the flood of stories, right? So, you know, as the canon changes from like kind of this one story narrative um, controlled by, um, like kind of Eurocentric, right? Controlled by the Eurocentric canon. Um, now, like we're th like people are breaking free from those shackles of like what I call the one story narrative that, you know, Native Americans and, you know, um, people from all of these different uh, ethnicities and backgrounds have only one story. Like if you're, you know, if you're from Mexico, then this is your one story about getting here to the United States, but we have thousands. Right. And like, that's what I think our responsibility is only to tell as many stories as we can. I guess that's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's that hits hard <laughs> um, in the heart. Um, Cynthia, yeah. What, what do you think the future of the future of your practice and the future of humanity is? How can we how, what do you have to say about, about that? Those two points. You know, I am really connected with all the things that Kara was saying, um, that the future is the present and how we see uh, how it reflects in, in this time or this context of the history. For me, I see myself working more with my community. Uh, I have this dream to, 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 to do more workshops inside the community, to mentor more youth people, children, but also um, I work closely now with women, indigenous women who have an uh, embroidery workshop. Most of them are married or grandmothers. So I also see the necessity in our communities of provide tools, provide um, not just mentorship. You know, we have in back in Mexico, we, we are here because you are there, this country. So we immigrate because we don't have other option. My family came back in the 80s uh because they are displaced economically displaced so here in this country we myself i feel that uh is providing us um tools to growing up as a humans but also as an artist and um, i haven't seen also through this year i work my my husband is a minister he was undocumented also for many years and now he's lutheran uh, minister and we work together a lot we collaborate together a lot in, through his church and since one year ago, we have been providing food and many other things for our community. So I haven't seen uh, a, a lot of difficulties, uh, not just for um, Latinos or indigenous uh, migrants, also Chinese communities, people of color. So I, I, I would like to, to also um, to see more human industry, uh, to reflect that we are living in a capitalist and a, a work and we cannot take out this component of our lives. Uh, but how can, for me, it's more a question, how can we um, uh, make uh, the capitalism um, to our side, you know, like how uh, capitalism can be, can reflect, you know, how the rich people ca can reflect or can share not just the, the, the money, uh, their, their tools, their resources, as Kara was saying, you know, how the, the, the states, all the states, not only the United States, Mexico has the same uh, prototype, you know, take the territories of the indigenous people or poor people. So I see um, uh, more, in, not just more inclusive in terms of race or ethnicity, uh, but also poor people, social class. In, in United States, I think that the, when the people speak about uh, inclusivity is more related with the race and in Mexico is, is together, you know, you are Morenito, you are Prieto, but also you are poor, you know, so 
Uh, and it's something that I have with friends who are coming from, from the same social class that I, that how difficult it is in Mexico to make it. And it's more easy in the United States, you know, because it's this culture of merito, the, the meritocracy, I don't know how to say it in English. But um, I see that, that how can we be together, you know, all the people that is here, maybe uh, create a, a bridge or a, or a group of solidarity to help each other. Um, to to make more inclusive um, and horizontal um, um, narratives or, or, or photo projects mm -hmm. based on the community. Thank you. Yeah, that's. I think about the word reparations, which I don't know if that's a proper word <laughs> for what we're talking about here. But I feel like there is like to you know to repair something into into make it whole again, you know, and balance. Um, how do you how do you see that uh, of it, creativity, the future of creativity, and this really the future of humanity? I think um, oftentimes, and I have said it, it's like it's and 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 you know I think both Cynthia and Kara had mentioned it that it's in what's in our control, right? Um, which is one way. It's like by me creating now, I'm already shaping the future. Do you know what I mean? And there's these immediate impacts. Now, let me tell you what I'm looking at the immediate impact, because one of my goals is to, as you know, Josue, uh, but to share with others, is really to look at all these communities that, that are underrepresented. And I don't look at them from a border, US, Mexico, what, what, to me, it's like, what is that true humanity that we want to share? But one of the responsibilities that me, myself, I'll speak towards the way I'm seeing the future is oftentimes as creatives, we like to talk to each other. We're like, wow, this is, I'm gonna do this and all my peers, everyone on this call, are gonna feel it and they're gonna like it and it's gonna inspire them to create change. I wanna flip the script and I wanna inspire that white kid in Arkansas, in Ohio, in Wisconsin, who doesn't like me or who has an, uh, a different perception of who I potentially am. So how can I use the power of creativity to spark change, empathy, inspiration, to create a better humanity? So that to me is the way I'm seeing the future is we as a community are gonna leverage all the tools that we can. Right now, I mean, if you look at the old and if we look at the trajectory the Industrial Revolution was all about goods. Photography was part of goods, to be honest. Digital was really about connectivity. Social was about new communities and hype and energy. And now this virtual world that we're stepping into is really, um, is really about finding new boundaries, knowing how to scale. But let's scale to the people that need to hear us. We already have each other's back. We're here to amplify it but let's get after those individuals that need to see this. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's a very recent conversation I had with someone I worked with literally this morning where I was like, I was like, that's, let's not make just for the people that agree with us, but let's, let's touch the hearts of those that have so much hate in their hearts that they need to disagree with us. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, and it's hard, you know, it's hard to make that, that, that leap to the future like that because we're also used to being being you know having another like the other ones right um but uh anyways i think we'll wrap up with the with the panel here and we're going to some q a i don't know if there's any questions there juliet yeah so i'm going to just open it up to everybody i'm gonna take us all off spotlight and we're going to end this portion and now have an open conversation with everybody who's in the room and anybody who would like to ask any questions. Um, feel free to put on your video, unmute yourself, feel like you're, you're part of uh, this circle. Um, well, I know we have maybe a couple more minutes here. Does anybody else have any more questions? Um, Oved, do you have any final remarks? No, I think this is, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is, this is uh, incredible. Um, and then uh, you guys can feel free to reach out to me uh, directly if uh, there's any other 
detailed questions, but Josue, I really appreciate you for bringing us here. I'm so excited to meet, um, you know, Cynthia and Cara and like just have this really inspirational conversation. Mm. Um, Thank you so much, man. Pre appreciate you. Um, all right, Julia, I think that that wraps it up. If no yeah. other questions. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here. It means so much to be able to openly have a dialogue about it and think about it. And that's the way we move forward in the society is by coming up with ideas and moving forward on them. So thank you everyone. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go learn my law right now. <laughs> see, you, uh, see you later. All right, thanks. All right, Bye. Care.